Poland, Germany's defeat amused the world, but it didn't dent German confidence. Weren't they traditionally slow starters? Derval was still there, pleading and cajoling when they played Chile and won 4-1 with the immaculate Karl-Heinz Rummenigge getting a hat-trick. Support for Germany began to evaporate after the 1-0 win over Austria that put both those teams through at the expense of Algeria, who weren't alone in claiming fix. FIFA will change the rules to prevent any suspicion of collusion at the next World Cup, but too late to dry Algerian tears. Against England, the West Germans showed a caution and respect that owed more to teams of yesteryear than the current national sides. The Germans felt afterwards that if they'd tried to win, they could have, and they certainly came the closest, even though Rummenigge was only half fit. nil-nil draw meant victory and goals against Spain would now decide England or West Germany for the semi-finals. <laughs> Arcanada's generosity contributed greatly to Germany's 2-1 defeat of the host nation, but England found him in more resistant mood and didn't get the goals they needed. So it was Germany who faced the flower of French football in a semi-final that went to extra time and where Germany trailed 3-1 before Rummenigge came on as a match-turning substitute. Litvaski onside. Rummenigge! Yes! Rummenigge has made it 3-2. Brent Forster. Litvaski. Rummenigge. Fischer! Klaus Fischer practices the overhead kick on a mattress, and German nerve proves strongest in the penalty shootout. Rubesch's goal put them into the final, but left a sour resentment among impartial observers, who felt goalkeeper Schumacher should have been sent off with his second half foul that laid out Batiston and the French given a penalty. Italy went to Spain looking old and familiar, with a 40-year-old captain and goalkeeper in Dino Zoff, and with their fans on a fanatical, flag-waving crusade. But the kiss of Italian support can turn more venomous than a rattlesnake when the results go wrong. After a nil-nil draw against Poland, it was in their second match against Peru that Italy got their first goal, and it was well worth waiting for. Made space well. Conti. Italian players wouldn't talk to Italian press because of things they'd written, and manager Enzo Berzot needed shuttle diplomacy to maintain a truce between warring camps. Some aspects of Italian football couldn't be changed by a saint. The handshakes before the match against Argentina were only the prelude to close encounters of the Italian kind. Maradona held it away from Gentile. Oh, dear. And Maradona was flattened by Gentili as a free kick was taken, and the referee's given another free kick. And he's got away and was pulled. Look at that. Gentili marked Maradona in more than one place, and Italy won 2 1. Brazilians was the new word coined during these World Championships to describe a Brazilian team who were everyone's favourites. Until Italy unstitched the dream with more close marking and with a freedom and fluency of football that was a joyful revelation. This was Rossi's renaissance. Oh, Rossi! And Rossi's in again! The man who kept his appetite for football alive during a two-year ban. Bagomi is up there, shot by Tardelli, and it's been turned in! Paolo Rossi was there again! Italy, without cynicism, can be the Brazil of Europe. In the semi-final against Poland, it was again Rossi's touch that proved decisive. Played in neatly, and a chance and a goal! Italy were proud and precise. Conti for Italy, and Paolo Rossi! And surely a 
Italy are in the final now. In the final and in the fountains of Rome too. Well, there won't be many Italians into fountains tonight, at least during the match. But now what we've seen, especially against the Brazilians, they're worthy favourites. And their supporters border on the fanatical. But it's worth remembering too, West Germany under Derval have never lost to a European team in four years. Tonight's World Cup final arena is custom built for football, for players and for spectators. And here sampling the atmosphere at pitch level is Bob Wilson. Well, the atmosphere down here at the moment is quite remarkable. A few of the German substitutes are just leaving the field, clearing the pitch, but it really is quite remarkable. I've managed to have the experience of playing in a few finals, but never, ever experienced anything quite as noisy as this. To the right of me here, the tremendous Italian section, and to the far corner, the Germans. It really is very, very noisy, and uh, I found one friend to my right here, and I'll go and meet him now, John Hollins of Arsenal. John, how long have you been out here? Just over a week now, Bob. For the semi-finals? To the semi-finals, what, what was possibly, the, I think, the best game of the tournament so far. Everything and 15 goals to go with it. What about this atmosphere here now? I'm just taking it all in at the moment, Bob. I wish I was out there playing. I've got the, I've got the nerves and the... And these, all these behind me, you can guess who I want to win. You'd obviously like to be out there yourself. I'd love to be out there. I've never, I've never been to this stadium before, and uh, it's just a day in a lifetime. And who are you going to tip for the, uh, for the winner? I've got to take Italy, Bob. I'm learning Italian very quickly. Well, that's the atmosphere down here at pitch level. It's very, very noisy. I'm not quite sure whether you're hearing me at home. The Italians are all in very great heart, and we're all looking forward very much to a remarkable final. So you're right. So and now to our four guests tonight, four of the most distinguished figures in football in this country. There's Bobby Charlton, England's favourite footballer, who's played or been involved in the last seven World Cup finals. And there's Laurie McMenemy of Southampton, one of our most popular managers, uh, who's so often been mentioned, of course, for the England job. And there's Bobby Robson, who's been mentioned even more often, and is now the new England manager. And Jimmy Hill, who's had such a major influence on football as a player, manager, director, and broadcaster. But we'll start with uh, Bobby Charlton here in the studio. Now, Bobby, as a striker yourself, enjoying seeing strikers play, we've got Rummenigge back after injury and so important to West Germany, and we've got Rossi back after suspension. He's had prison problems over bribery, but back scoring goals. They're both joint leading goal scorers at five goals each, and both could have a major influence. Yeah, well, they will have a major influence simply because of that, that they're tremendous strikers. Um, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, when he came on in the semi-final against France, uh, before he even touched the ball, you could sense the influence that he had on the rest of the players. Suddenly, they all felt as though there was, there was strength in the team, which he'd been missing before. And he just kept picking up balls, going at players, and the rest of them just followed suit. Now, Carlo Rossi, uh, this Paolo Rossi, rather, uh, when they started the competition early on in uh, Gijon, was, was struggling badly and um, needed someone just to light the spark. And his goals against Brazil really were, were what it was all about. And yeah, they are the two major influences. And the winner tonight will probably be in the winning side, I was quite sure of that. Uh, Bobby Robson, uh, Bob, do you feel that the fact that they've chosen a defender, Bergomi, to take the place of Antonio, a midfield player, is significant in the Italian lineup? Bobby Robson. Did you hear that, Bob? Sorry, I didn't hear that, no. You said, <laughs> well, we'll try again then. I, know I can't hear a thing. I know you've got a hell of a noise behind you. Can Bergomi you hear me at all? Bergomi was picked as a defender uh, for midfield. Well, I think that's uh, a question of injury, uh, David. I mean, I don't... I uh, think for a, one moment that the uh, Italian manager has selected that particular player for today, uh, other than that, I mean, he obviously wanted to play Antonagoni, or whatever his name is, um, because he's the one, I think, who can stimulate a bit of their forward play, which obviously has put Italian football in the final, because... Uh, Bobby, perhaps Jimmy can enter. Can you hear me now, OK? Uh, I the... can hear you now, yeah, yes. Yeah, good. The team news is actually Antonio doesn't play. That's Antonio right. doesn't play, That's and he's right, chosen the man who's been taking the place of uh, um, Gentili in defence, Bergomi, to take his place, which suggests he's going to play in a defensive manner. Well, I mean, this is the one thought in my mind, David. I mean, having played so well to get here in the first place, I was wondering whether the Italians would, in fact, lose their nerve a little bit and change their style. I mean, they get to certain situations, don't they, at, at this sort of level, when then you know, they feel as though they've got to go back 
to their defensive football, you know, which, which they're so familiar at. It'll be a shame. I just hope that the Italians don't lose the nerve in this marvellous uh, situation which is presented here today and that they play today and make it the match that everybody's hoping to. Of course, they've got the footballing ability, haven't they? Now, Jimmy Hill, uh, it does seem significant, Jim, uh, that this change has been made. I mean, we know Antonio New can't play, he's not fit, he's got several stitches in the instep, uh, but it is a defensive move. Yes, it is, but they never really have attacked with all that many players. I mean, their strength has been that they've been able to create attacks with uh, Rossi Graziani, who is playing, incidentally, uh, you, despite the fact that he was carried off on a stretcher, very severely wounded, of course, the other day, and Conti. They don't very often push many more men up than that, and as soon as they do, they get them back very quickly. So I don't think uh, it will stop the kind of raids that the Italians have been doing, but it does suggest that they don't intend to give any goals away to the Germans either. Thanks, Jim. Well, we want to release you two to go uh, down to the commentary box, but I'd like a quick line from both of you. Uh, Bobby Robson first, Italy or West Germany, Bobby? No, I've seen a lot of West Germany. I've followed them throughout the tournament. I'm going to stick with them. I like their durability, and, and, and that's the team for me. Uh, uh, Jimmy? Well, I'm going with Italy because they've had three marvellous results. They've beaten Argentina, they've beaten Brazil, and they've beaten the Poles, who beat the French. So why should we begin to doubt them now? So that's one for West Germany, one for Italy. We're hearing you at half time. Thanks very much indeed. Um, one of our elder statesmen sitting here in judgment. Oh, not so elder, in fact, but still <laughs> sitting there full of wisdom as usual. Laurie McMenemy. Good to see Bobby's got an interpreter now. He's England manager there, isn't it? <laughs> that, uh, or unless the job's made him deaf already. Um, I think that we're talking about forwards, which is nice because we like the attacking play. Uh, we've also got to mention, I think, the two goalkeepers, David, because Dino Zoff's been tremendous, hasn't he? 40 year old, captain of the team, and he's even been settling them down back in the hotel because of the problems with the press. And the other fella, Schumacher, has everybody's pet hate at the minute because he committed the most cynical foul any of us have seen in the last game and put the French out really. Uh, by moving on the penalties as well when he saved a penalty. And because of that, everybody suddenly likes the Italians. But I think we've got to detach ourselves from all of that. And personally, I think that the organisation and, and the gradual improvement that the Germans have made and the added boost that Rummenigge will undoubtedly give them uh, will help them, I think, today. The Italians will miss Antonioni, uh, but on the other What is West Germany nil, Italy nil? And we'll be hearing about that first half from our ex experts in a moment. Bobby Robson, the new England manager, Laurie McMenemy and Bobby Charlton. In the meantime, though, the news headlines from Jan Leeming. The liner Canberra, carrying 2,000 Marine commandos home from the Falklands, was given a jubilant welcome when she docked in Southampton today. Prince Charles flew out by helicopter to greet the men as thousands of relatives and friends crowded the dockside. It's three months since Canberra sailed to the Falklands and only one month since the successful assault on Port Stanley. And the crowds joined with the Marines in turning the homecoming into a day of patriotic fervour. Italy and West Germany and uh, we've got uh, Laurie McMenemy, Bobby Charlton and the New England manager Bobby Robson. Uh, Bobby Robson first, what do you think of that first half? Well, it got off to the, to the start, David, I thought it would. Uh, a bit of caginess by both teams, a lot of man-for-man -man marking, uh, and as a result, there wasn't too much forward play. I'm rather sorry the penalty was missed, because I think that's what it needed. If a goal had come then, I think Italy would have gone on and been exciting, and Germany obviously would have had to play a lot better. But, uh, and it would have you know, obviously proved a better spectacle, but, but, but because after that, it went a little bit dull again. There's lots of 1v1 confrontations, David. I mean, I think little Lebaski, and I've seen a lot of him, can still win it for Germany. He's obviously got to try and get the ball in the penalty areas against, against Gentili because he's given him some hammer outside the box. And I think if you could get the ball in better in a dangerous area, I can see a penalty happening at the other end. For Italy, Conti's marvellous. Good tactic there because he's left-sided and he's playing on the right-hand side of the Italian flank and he's coming inside of... Uh, of, uh, of the number two um, and as a result you know he's given him some problems and Rossi is dangerous if he gets the chance I love the way Rossi is always on the half turn and if we get the serve or if Italy could get the service to him he's always looking to play the way he's facing Bobby we're and just gonna uh, we're just gonna have a look at that penalty incident you obviously had no doubt about it but uh, I, thought I, it was, I thought I thought it was a brave decision by the referee David but I thought it was clear-cut 
I didn't think the German defender had made any attempt to play the ball at all. Yeah, well, it was Briegel. We put on them because they're in a blind save position, but he was very strong and fourth right there. It's a pity he hadn't been like that on some of the fouls earlier on. But here you see a different angle, and the big defender, you see, he's pushing him away with his hand, and uh, the lad just kind of get his header in at all. And that, of course, is where he scored a very similar position in the last game. Uh, Bobby Charlton, a firecracker was thrown just before the penalty was taken. There was still some smoke in the penalty area. I was a bit surprised that uh, kicker Cabrini went ahead and took it. Yeah, well, that's pro probably right. Uh, the referee really should have gone over and made sure that the, the dust had cleared first. But well, actually, when the penalty was taken, I thought that the goalkeeper must have moved before. Uh, but as it turns out, looking at that replay, he didn't. And Cabrini knocked, uh, knocked it wide. I mean, he's going to be hated, I suppose, in Italy until they actually win this match. But... I think definitely a bad penalty. Laurie spotted something then. What was There's that? Another Italian in the box there. Just noticed that. But uh, I mean, that uh, would have gone against Italy if they, if he'd scored probably. So uh, of course, technically that's an offence, isn't it? Uh, well spotted right. too. I think you're right actually. Let's have a look at that. Um, we'll have to run it back for a moment. Quite other referee might have been a bit firmer, mightn't he? But let's have another look now. Is there another Italian in the box? Well, the fellow on the left starts on the lane and he goes yeah. into the box. No. Just as he hits. Just as he hits. But technically, he shouldn't be in there at all, of course. But you watch all the white fellas, white shirted fellas, their arms go up in the air. But look where the, the man is. He's, he's going there to follow up, of course, in case it rebounds. But uh, that was a great big let off. And it, I, I agree with Bobby. It was a pity it didn't go in because the game needed that. I got more excited watching the Canberra coming to Southampton this morning, quite yeah. honestly. Mm. It has been a good final. Bobby. Yeah, well, it, it's been cagey up to now. I mean, I've never seen, seen so many free kicks given away uh, and fouls, petty fouls. Some of them, poor old Bruno Conti got booked for one that was so uh, incidental compared with some of the other things that had gone on before. Um, I'll tell I'll... you what, Bobby. Uh, Bobby Robson made the point as well. And during the first half, you've been enthusing here in the studio about the skills of Conti. Let's yeah. just enjoy the... Another incident here. Uh, Paul Briegel again, actually. Beautiful piece of skill. Knocks it with his left foot and then crosses it with his right foot. I mean, has a min minimum of, uh, of effort there, absolutely superb. Actually, Laurie spotted him the other day and he's been raving about him uh, ever since. Uh, Bobby Robson's reinforced that point as well. Mm. Uh, and just, uh, Bobby Robson, uh, you've obviously enjoyed Conti, but it did seem to us in the studio that the Conti booking, by comparison with some of the things that had happened earlier, was a bit of a joke. Oh, absolutely. Um, that was minor compared to what has gone on. I mean, Gentile is knocking everybody over. He's doing a man-for-man -man marking job on Lebaski. He sorted out Breitner in midfield and uh, slowed him down for about 20 minutes. And actually, in fact, he might just, if he can shake off the knock, and it looks as though he has, he might uh, do a bit for, the, for German football because he can run with the ball and he can run through the heart of that uh, uh, Italian midfield. And, and, this is what's got to happen. Germany have got to get the extra man in because the sweeper system at the back of, with Italy is causing the, you know, the German attack uh, lots of problems. They're not getting anything free. Rummenigge is having a poor match. He's, he's played wide for a period of time. He's wasted on the wing as far as I'm concerned because he's, he doesn't cross balls and he can't go past people. He has this little bit of an injury and it looks as though it's, he's struggling there. With I'll it. tell you what, Bobby, you've thrown up two points there we can illustrate. Uh, there's the Conti booking, which Laurie wants to talk about, and you also mentioned Fisher and Gentili. And, of course, Fisher got his own back in a moment, but we'll see first the Conti booking. Conti is over here in a defensive position at the minute on the right-hand side, and he goes... I don't think it's too cynical, lad. I think his timing was off, and he's a very enthusiastic lad. If you watch him, he gets on with the game. He wants to take the free kicks very, very quickly. And here, the referee's already blown, and uh, he surprised everybody, I think, by getting the, the yellow card. Out, then. Now, having seen that, let's have a look at that Fisher Gentili clash. Now, Gentili does uh, put his Gentili that was doing it, you know, we'd have been asking for him to be strung up. I wonder if a British referee would have been better for this final. Actually, think, uh... Bobby Robson, there is a point here. This is the first uh, South American to, to referee a World Cup final, and he's got two European teams to deal with. Uh, do you support the idea he's having problems out there? Yes, I do. I don't think he knows uh, what represents uh, a bad foul and what isn't. And uh, he, he took Conti's name, and if he's going to be consistent, there should be about eight bookings in here, and everybody here in the second half has, has, would have had a chance of being sent off. So he's lost a little bit of control in that situation. Bobby, can, can I ask Bob, uh, do you think if Ruminegger isn't playing as well uh, this time that he might go off and Rubesh might come on? Do you think it might make well, a good difference there? Uh? Well, he, he's got to... He should try that, or he should do with Rummenigge what he did after uh, Germany had lost to Algeria, Laurie, which is where he played Rummenigge from midfield, in the middle, alongside Breitner. 
you know, 30 yards back, coming on to stuff. Now, he looked a far better player in that position when I saw him up in uh, Guillaume Noviedo. That's when he started uh, scoring the goals then, That's right, he, yeah. and he got a hat-trick against Chile in that position. Now, he's, abs he's an absolute... I mean, he's wasting his match out here outside, right? Because he, I would think he's never played there in his career anyway. He's not in where the, where the bullets are. I mean, he's, he's out of the dangerous area, and he's a prolific goal scorer. And when he's, when he's saddled out in an isolated position in the wing, I mean, you've lost all his strength. Yeah. So I would think they've either got to play him in a better position, or they take him off and they bring on Rubesh. Bobby, is uh, Brighton being man-to-man -man marked? We can yes. see only little on there. Yes, yes, he is. Tardelli is, is trying to uh, dig into him. I think that battle there is just being won by Brighton a little bit. Brighton seems to be giving a bit more support to the German forward player than Tardelli, and I think that might be just one of the key battles of the afternoon in the second half. I think Tardelli is tiring a bit more than Brighton, and Brighton is a very strong lad, and he's got a bit of pace through the heart of that defence with a ball, and I think, um, you know, if he, if he, get, if he gets a, a, a sign and a show of things, he just get, he, he will pre create the extra man, I think, which the Germans need. There's one quick, quick comment I'd like uh, from any one of the three of you. Uh, it does seem to me that uh, Alter Belli coming on in place of Graziani has made a big difference. Alter Belli's contribution has been minimal, and Graziani yes. is so important. Graziani. Yes, I think, I, I think uh, Italy have had two tremendous blows, David and Mesa. I mean, the penalty obviously is a blow, and I think losing Graziani after seven minutes was a, was a terrible blow. And uh, with Antigone not playing in the, in, in the match anyway, it looks as though the cup is written on, on, on the name of Germany. I mean, yes. everything's gone their way. You're obviously staying with them. Thanks very much indeed, Bob, for joining us, because I know you want Thank to get you. down that uh, ladder. Uh, the, <laughs> Laurie says you need a parachute, don't you? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, and so he's staying with West Germany. Now, Laurie. Well, I started with them, but I mean, I'm not trying to pretend I, I knew any more than anybody else, because I think it could have gone either way, but the organisation and the experience of certain players like Breitner is shining through and Stieliger, and the only doubt I had about the Germans, really, I mean, I'm saying they've won it yet, they haven't, of course, but the Foster brothers, who are fairly new and untried, uh, there could be a Norman. Now, the last time two brothers played in a World yeah. Cup final was 1966. I can't yeah. remember the names, but uh, yeah. they did pick up a medal, <laughs> and uh, it could well be that that happens today. Yeah. Well, I, I take Bobby's point of, of um, Rubinier coming in and joining in midfield with Breitner. Uh, when they did this against France, they completely took over the, re the rest of the match. And if Rubesh comes on, he, he's the type of person, really, that wouldn't be intimidated by your Gentiles or your Skirias. Um, and there could be a problem for Italy there. Graziani is one of, one of the players that I always class as very English in his, in his type. He always is very mobile, gets around up front, takes a lot of the workload so that people like Rossi can, can find a little bit of space. Um, the replacement, Alter Belli, hasn't done this at all. And uh, I think the signs are not good for Italy, uh, especially after missing a penalty when I, I would think at half-time, when they've got ten minutes to think about it, they'll probably be the worst for wear afterwards. But they're still a very, very confident side, and with little Bruno, I would never discount them because he is a terrific worker. He's got tremendous skill and vision, and if there is a chance going round about the 18-yard box, he'll make the most of it without question. Uh, who, if, if, if you made the changes on the German side you've suggested, who would you take off? I mean, Fisher's not playing badly, but Barsley's causing trouble. Well, well uh, I, probably Rummenigge won't want to come off, and he's no. a very strong yeah. character. But he won't uh, come off, I don't think. No. Rummenigge won't come off. I mean, he, he made it quite clear before the match that he intended to play for the whole 90 minutes, uh, and he won the, he won the verbal you know, battle. One of the lesser lads, so. like Dremler or somebody, yeah. might have to be shuffled yeah. off. But uh, I, I think that they've got more strength to come on than the Italians had, because poor Rossi looks very lonely there now, whereas if Frubesch came on and, and lit Barsky, who's Bobby Robson's... Uh, tip for to do great things, uh, Rubesh, I think, would benefit from Lidbarski's crosses. If Actually, well, the players should be out in just a second, but I just want a very quick comment from you both as pros. Um, when both sides are faced with a problem, you see football in this final at its most cynical. Mm. Well, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's why a British referee, I mean, Jack Tiller didn't mess around when Germany and Holland played. He gave a penalty early on, he, and he would book anybody, and, and this fella hasn't done that. But the way it's gone, I would agree that as soon as there's a problem, you get a foul. Uh, Bobby? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that also the players are making a, a big meal of it. It is a professional game it, against between two of the most professional outfits, what we class as the professional outfits. And they, they'll milk it dry if they can. Um, it's up to the referee then to take control and to make sure that the game flows and the public enjoy it, watching it. It's not showing a game in good light. This is the pity of it. It is the, uh, the best game 
you know, in four years it's supposed to be. And I think this is a disappointment, really, that we've seen better earlier games, like with Brazil involved in particular, and there's no British team here. So this needed to be a classic, and it's far from that at the moment. But now, we've had some bad starts in the first half. Maybe the second half will live up to some of the, the good ones that we've seen this last week. Anyway, you all seem to be leaning, even Bobby who tipped Italy, towards uh, West Germany at the moment. Uh, the players are coming out now for the start of the second half. No score at half-time in this uh, World Cup final. And in the commentary box, Jimmy Hill and John Watson. Just uh, taking up Laurie McMenemy's point there about brothers in the World Cup final. It, there's been uh, one or two examples of that. The Forsters today, the Charltons, as Laurie mentioned, the Van der Kerkhoffs from Holland. And back in 1954, I'm not sure if it was an omen, when the West Germans beat Hungary, Fritz and Otto Volta were in their side. So it does seem to be something of a habit to have brothers in teams that play in the final of the World Cup. And while we're talking about history, Antonio Cabrini of Italy has to live with the fact that he's the first man to miss a penalty in a World Cup final. Here with his thoughts on the second half is Jimmy Hill. Well, that thought frightened the life out of me, John. I mean, what a responsibility to be the only one to do it in the history of World Cup football. My goodness, he must feel worse than ever, but uh, maybe his side can come back and save him and say never in the field of football conflict will so much gratitude have been shown by one man to his colleagues. Uh, Kick-off coming up now. I'm still sticking with Italy. Uh, I, I think the German luck has got to run out sometime. Rummenigge has stayed on, as we suspected, and uh, I do just wonder whether he's doing his team justice. But uh, there's Rupp Derbold. He's a jolly little man. He always seems unperturbed and happy and with no worries on his mind. Maybe that's good for his team because they play that way, whatever the score is. But let's hope the second half is going to be so much better than the first. It could hardly be worse, I'm afraid. Go back a long way for the last time. That was 38, and they also won it in 34. Well, now back here in the studio, Laurie McMenemy and Bobby Charlton, who enjoyed the match enormously think the result just, but disagree entirely about the player of the match. Tardelli, they say, has been the player, named the player of the match, but for you that's not right, is it, Bobby? No, I thought Bruno Conti um, was the man of the match easily on, on what we've seen on the television here tonight. Um, even at the end of the match when he went to the referee to try and get the ball from him, I thought that was fairly just because he'd had it most of the match anyway. Um, no, he, he was absolutely superb, although Italy in the second half came through and, and they had lots of people they could be proud of, they could be proud of. Yeah, it was justified over the latter stages of the tournament that Italy should win and uh, it was nice to see their bits of skill coming out and even when they taunted the Germans that was good because they had to be comfortable on the ball to be able to do that. And I think if Rossi's going to get a knighthood, old uh, yeah. Conti could well get, get canonised or something, <laughs> but I mean, I've never heard of a sin Bruno before, have you? <laughs> I tell you what, we'll have a look at, uh, uh, at the goals, um, because Italy in the last few matches have really started hitting them, haven't they? Now, the ball was played wide here. Now, this is number six, Gentili. Well, he just knocks his near post ball in. It's missed by the first player, and Paolo Rossi comes in, knocks it into the back of the net. Uh, we thought Cabrini might have got his head to it, but it wasn't. It was only that he picked the ball out of the net. That would have been a little bit apt as well, seeing that he missed the penalty in the first half. But Daddy, and now Bobby Charlton on the third goal that really finished it. Well, here he is, Bruno Conti coming in. Very remind, reminds me a lot of Jeff Hurst's goal, this actually. But he has a look up, spots inside. Altabelli. Altabelli. Brings it round the goalkeeper and tucks it inside the far post. Uh, by that time, obviously, the Germans were a bit depressed, you know, and not marking as efficiently as they should have done, really. But still a terrific goal. Now, Laurie, when you look back on this uh, World Cup, I mean, what a remarkable World Cup we've had. The Italians in qualifying were in the same group as Poland, the Cameroons and Peru and didn't actually win a match. That's right. They drew every match and finished second and went up because they scored more goals well, than the Cameroons. Your pal, the Cameroons water courier, <laughs> the goalkeeper you fell in love with, uh, it was very unlucky because his team only got one goal, only scored one goal rather, and Italy scored two, and they got through. And that was at the period when everybody was saying, "Oh, Italy aren't as good this time." But they were just getting acclimatised then, and, and they've gone from strength to strength. I'm delighted for the manager. I think I always feel for managers. I'm disappointed for Durval, who's a nice man. Whenever I've met him, but Beardsot, I think, has bounced back from tremendous criticism in his own country, and a nice human touch even at the end when he put Cousio on to get him a medal with two minutes to go. It was very nice. Sir. Quick final word, Bobby. Well, I think it's been a terrific World Cup. I've seen lots of t tremendous matches and it revives your faith in the game, really. And as much as um, there's nothing like a first-class football match played at international level. And I've seen three or four outstanding games, which, which makes it really makes you feel that it's worth going on with football because it is a fantastic game. 
Thanks very much indeed, Bobby. And Italy, the new world champions, beating West Germany by three goals to one. Well, so we come to the end of the biggest carnival of football ever staged. A tournament which brought together the famous and the unknown. A four million pounds Maradona from the Argentine and a goalkeeper from the Cameroons who delivers water by cart for a living and whose team went home undefeated. The household names of South America and Europe have been matched by unknown Arabs and Africans and men from New Zealand, all sharing the experience of playing football at the highest level and sharing, too, those moments ranging from joy to injustice. From the BBC World Cup team, goodbye. from right back. and he's got past Tendilio. And off the line, oh, it's strong! He'll come across to cover, but he's beaten him. And pulls it back to Bonnier. on this side, Antonio Cabrini from left back, chipping it in, and a possibility for, oh Rossi, Rossi's got it! Great ball for Sharmak. Oh, well, this time the post came to his aid. Isn't that remarkable?
Andrew Lloyd Webber's music for World Cup Grandstand is now available on a BBC record. Tomorrow night, BBC One joins a gala dinner with the Variety Club of Great Britain in honour of 60 years of broadcasting by the BBC. Cliff Mitchellmore introduces guests including Sir Robin Day, Brian Johnston, Andre Previn and George Howard. A celebration of 60 years live from London tomorrow at 9.25. Well, in 15 minutes, the first of a series of six inscrutable investi investigations for the Chinese detective. That's in 15 minutes, but first we have the news from Jan Leeming. Canberra and the Marines are home. 2,000 Royal Marine Commandos back from the Falklands fighting were given an emotional welcome when the liner turned troop ship sailed into Southampton this morning. Thousands of relatives and friends were on the quayside and Prince Charles flew out to the ship by helicopter to greet the Marines personally. It's three months since Canberra left Southampton laden with troops for the Falklands where she survived waves of Argentine air attacks during the San Carlos landings. Peter Main reports on today's jubilant welcome home for the ship, her troops and crew. The Great White Whale, that's what the troops on the Falklands christened the Canberra. And as the 45,000 ton cruise liner turned troop ship steamed towards our home port, accompanied by an armada of vessels of all shapes and sizes, it was easy to see why. On the quayside, families and well-wishers strained for that first glimpse of their husband, son or friend. Canberra took the Marines to the Falklands three long months ago. She took them right into San Carlos Bay, where the Argentines tried to bomb her. But Canberra survived that and many other problems on her epic 27,000-mile voyage. The Prince of Wales flew out to the Canberra to welcome her home, piloting the Wessex helicopter himself. As the vessel neared her berth, Lynx helicopters of the Army Air Corps display team flew past in salute, the port firefighting ship adding her welcome. Two of the 14 women who sailed with the liner to and from the Falklands. Part of the 400 P&O crew volunteered to face danger and were now back home. As the excitement mounted, the whole occasion took on a carnival air with more than a touch of the last night of the proms thrown in. John Humphreys flew out to the Canberra and was on board as she docked. 
it's an absolutely remarkable sight from here it looks absolutely wonderful and the men on board just can't believe it's happening they keep wandering around and saying it's unbelievable it's unbelievable somebody somebody just said it's better than winning the world cup i've actually got with me uh, brigadier julian thompson brigadier i don't know whether you, you'd agree with the, the world cup thing but what do you make of it it's also fantastic i was struck absolutely dumb by it it is amazing i've never seen so many boats and so many people it is unbelievable actually it's rather tear-jerking i'm afraid <laughs> well you, you you look a little bit taken aback by it yeah, all, I, I must say. Absolutely. I'm in shock, emotional shock or something. <laughs> and, and this from a man who's just gone through the whole Falklands campaign. Yes, well, one tends to think of those who aren't here sometimes. So uh, that was it's fantastic, actually. Quite amazing. Altogether, 237 British servicemen died in the Falklands. The Argentines lost three times as many. Canberra's captain, Dennis Scott Masson, was with his vessel throughout the 92-day voyage and was now clearly delighted to be back. And he watched as Brigadier Thompson led the first of the Marines down the gangway. The quayside soon became a sea of green berries as the men made their way to the dock sheds where they were reunited with their families in private. The youngest Marine to serve in the Falklands, 17-year-old Martin Tate, was one of the first there. The men yomped across the Falklands, carrying packs heavier than these, and they paid tribute to their recent enemies. We're four five, we took the two sisters, and we were in the impression that there were Argentinian Marines on there. Yeah. They were really tough fighters, were they? Well, they've got a good strap on. They've got some good equipment, and if they've had a bit more bottle, we might have had a bit of better fight. The only civilian to make the voyage was Jack Abbott, who explained how he managed it. Well, I was some help to, some help to the troops. A bit of a cagey about that, did you? I mean, you chatted them up. No, no, no I, I looked after them. My, economy, my house was full of paratroops. The Colonel down. Oh, I had a wonderful crowd in my house. Disembarkation took several hours, the Marines being ferried to their bases at Plymouth and Arbroath in a special fleet of buses. As for the Canberra, she's now going to have a six-week refit, which will cost between seven and eight million pounds. P&O say she should be back in service as a luxury cruise liner in September. It's reported tonight from the Falklands that there was an air raid alert last night when an unidentified aircraft flew into the exclusion zone. The plane apparently disappeared from radar screens 15 minutes later, but it seems that while the alert lasted, people in Stanley were told to switch off their lights and some were sent home from work. An all clear is said to have been broadcast over Falklands radio, but the Defence Ministry in London say at the moment they have no information on the incident. Rail services have again been badly hit by the train driver's strike. There were no trains at all on Western Region or in and out of Euston Station. Our Labour Relations correspondent Martin Aidney says a major return by drivers tomorrow isn't likely. The train driver's leader, Ray Buckton, called a news conference to say there'd be no end to the strike unless British Rail changed its dictatorial attitude. What message did he have for people hoping to travel? I'm actually saying to the travelling public, I'm sorry that British Railways Board is only looking for 5,000 people to go to work tomorrow. We're looking for 26,000 locomotive men to drive the trains and get them running. So I'm saying to British Railways Board, if you will undo the wrong you did, and you will suspend that, those rosters, then those 26,000 people uh, could be, um, those 26,000 drivers could be at work. That's what I'm looking for. Well, the next couple of days will be make or break for this rail strike, and today a very defiant no surrender from Mr. Ray Buckton here at the Aslev headquarters. He's clearly been encouraged by the weekend support from Mr. Michael Foote, the leader of the Labour Party. And today, like his officials, he's been at a meeting of Aslev drivers which continue to support his stand. For British Rail, unless they can get a service running in the next couple of days, very much better than what they've managed over the past week, they look like having to make very serious decisions on Tuesday to lay off staff and maybe to dismiss as left strikers. And if that were to happen, it'll plunge this dispute into new levels of bitterness and difficulty. 
Fighting in Beirut has reached a new intensity with the heaviest shelling so far by the Israelis. Earlier in the day, the Israeli cabinet was reported to have studied military options to force Palestinian guerrillas out of the city. Officials said afterwards that the prolonged peace talks were seen as a PLO attempt to buy time. In Beirut, 21 Israeli soldiers were wounded in today's fighting. One of their camps sustained a direct hit during a PLO rocket attack, but the Israelis themselves have carried on pounding targets. Bill Hamilton reporting. This has now become something of a familiar sight in West Beirut, but for the 200,000 people still living here, each day brings another frightening chapter in the War of Nerves. At any time of the day or night, another barrage of Israeli and Palestinian gunfire suddenly opens up, sending innocent civilians running for shelter. Despite the enormous strength of the Israeli presence, the PLO show no signs of ending their resistance. The talk over the past few days has centered on hopes that a compromise might be reached. The reality here in West Beirut is something quite different. The artillery fire continues, the exchanges are becoming more frequent, and now Syria's refusal to accept the 6,000 strong PLO force makes an acceptable end to this siege seem as far off as ever. But the suffering caused by this war of attrition has now spread way beyond the bounds of West Beirut. Families desperate to escape Palestinian rocket and artillery fire are fleeing underground. An anxious father led us 30 feet below this building still under construction. We descended two flights of stairs in total darkness to reach an underground car park which has now become home for three of his daughters hit by shrapnel from an exploding shell. They are not the only young casualties of this conflict who settled for a dismal, though safer, existence underground. The longer the siege of Beirut continues, the greater the misery for those for whom there is no reprieve. The Israeli shelling of West Beirut has angered many diplomats still working in the city. At least seven embassies have been damaged, as well as a number of buildings which have no apparent connection with either side. Christopher Morris saw the effects of an earlier bombardment. The Israeli blitz along West Beirut's seafront lasted nine hours. PLO strongholds were supposed to have been the targets. These were simply holiday apartments. Serious questions are now being asked here about the intention and accuracy of Israel shelling. Neither this holiday hotel nor the tourist shopping centre could be considered as legitimate military targets. Certainly not the Algerian embassy, severely damaged in what seems to have been indiscriminate shelling by the Israelis, impatient to destroy the trapped guerrillas as negotiations drag on. This missile, a cluster bomb, hit the embassy after being fired from an Israeli gunboat just offshore. It was a direct hit, the inside of the building practically destroyed. There's no doubt that Israel's repeated shelling is overshadowing the optimism of a negotiated settlement of the crisis. The fact that seven foreign embassies, including that of the Soviet Union, have now been badly damaged by Israeli shells has only made matters worse. Beirut Radio said tonight that yet another ceasefire had been agreed and was due to take effect an hour ago. So far, it's not been observed. Search is still going on among wreckage of the Boeing 727 which crashed at New Orleans on Friday, killing 152 people. Eight people are still in hospital, among them 16-month-old Melissa Trahan, who was dragged from the rubble of her home. There's a kid alive. you got a kid alive over there. What? A kid is alive over there. Noticed uh, like a mattress and a carpet went up and down. At first I thought it was an illusion. And I looked again, and I yelled to him, I said, give me a hand, I have something moving under here. And uh, we, we grabbed the, the rubble and we pulled it back, and there was a little girl on the stomach, trying to push up, trying to get up. And I said, she's alive, it's a baby. I said, get me a doctor. Little Melissa is now recovering from serious burns. 
Searchers have found the aircraft's flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder. It's hoped they'll explain the cause of the crash. Experts now say it wasn't lightning as they thought at first. Italy are the World Cup champions. They beat West Germany 3-1 in Madrid this evening to win the trophy for the third time. The Italians missed a penalty in the first half but scored three fine goals in the second. John Motson described... There was support for only one team in Soho in London tonight where every Italian restaurant was crowded with supporters of the Azzurri, the Blues. Bloom was widespread when Italy missed that early penalty, but as Italy added goals in the second half, the London streets rang with shouts of Mediterranean joy. And that's all from me for this weekend. Good night. Well, now look at the weather, and most parts of the country will have a dry, bright day tomorrow with some sunshine, making it quite warm. Southwest England may have a shower from time to time, and late in the day there could be a shower in other southern counties. Now with news of tomorrow's panorama, here's David Lomax. For a month now, Israeli forces have been poised above West Beirut. Down below, under the bombardment, people are dying. No more blood. It's enough like this, blood. It's enough like this. Thousands of civilians have already fled from their homes, but the Palestinian fighters still won't move. If diplomatic efforts to persuade them fail, the Israelis are determined to throw them out. If you could make it a parallel of a cancer operation, you might have to take a little, a little bit out. It might hurt a bit, but in the long run, you might save a country's life. People caught in this conflict live under the constant threat of death. I hate Israel! I hate! A panorama team has just returned from three weeks inside West Beirut. Our report, Fighting for Survival, is on Panorama tomorrow at ten past eight. The Money Programme, special on BBC Two shortly, Reds in the Red, looks at the economic crisis facing some of the communist countries with almost all credit from the West now cut off. For our next programme here on BBC One, there are CFAX subtitles on page 170 for those viewers with hearing difficulty. David Yip stars as the Chinese detective in the first of a series of six investigations.